This show is sponsored in part by St. Germain Catering, a woman-owned business that is professional in every delicious detail. And Fairfax Social Sports, Northern Virginia's largest co-ed men's and women's adult sports league with over 32,000 players who participate in flag football, softball, basketball, and other adult sports. And finally, the Ruddy Law Firm in Fairfax City, Virginia, a law firm that provides legal services in the fields of business, probate, estate planning, and elder law. Welcome to the Probate Nation and the show How to Probate an Estate. Our previous episodes started with the probate journey on how to get qualified as an executor, explaining what notices must be given to the beneficiaries and the probate office, and how to file the inventory with the Commission of Accounts. And recently, recently we reviewed some of the initial tax considerations at the outset of probate administration. So at this point, our executor has a certificate of qualification in hand and a federal employer identification number for the estate. Now the real work begins as we continue the probate journey today with a discussion as to what needs to be done to identify, collect, and marshal the assets of the decedent. What an executive does at this stage and how it is completed will go a long way towards ensuring a smooth ride on the probate train. It is a good fortune to have two experienced estate administration and probate attorneys with us today to review some of these steps an executor should take at this stage of the probate journey. With us today is a local attorney who has been in private practice for 24 years with the law firm of Mary H. Lawrence, PC, in Fairfax, Virginia. Her practice is limited to estate planning, probate, and elder law. She is also a certified elder law attorney, which is a great accomplishment among elder law attorneys. Also joining our distinguished panel is another local attorney. He has been in private practice with the firm of Baskin Jackson in Falls Church, Virginia, for 34 years and is widely recognized as one of the leading estate administration attorneys in Northern Virginia. His practice is also limited to estate planning, probate, and fiduciary matters. Please join me in welcoming attorney Mary Lawrence and John Jackson. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you, Richard. You know, can you explain what the term marshalling the assets means in the probate process? Mary? I think what it means gathering all the assets of the deceased person, those assets in checking accounts, real estate, brokerage firms, all the assets that have now been left in that per deceased person's name have to be controlled by the executor. And it takes, a, 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 the first step in the job for the executor is to compile a list of all the deceased person's assets. And as part of that process is, is not just to, to uh, it's also to identify because some of those assets may in fact not actually go through probate but might be important to know about. John, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that pretty much covers it, just to identify the assets. So uh, <clears throat> when, a, when a client asks you, you for their help in, in the process of administering an estate but does not know what assets they need to collect, how do you, what do you tell them to do as far as how to identify those assets? That actually happens uh, nearly all the time, that, that <laughs> somebody's called upon to administer an estate and they're not aware of what uh, the assets are. So there's some simple steps we can take. First thing you want to do is get the mail forwarded, because every month you get a bank statement that shows you the balance in the bank, uh, brokerage statements, uh, real estate bills, and so forth. So get the mail forwarded to you as soon as you can. We always want to go through their desk at home, wherever they keep their financial records. Uh, what I'm looking for there mostly is tax returns. Mm -hmm. If you look at last year's tax return on Schedule B, it shows the source of dividends and interest. So we see if there's a dividend from uh, ABC Bank or whatever we know to look there. Um, also, Schedule E would show you rental income if there's real estate. Mm -hmm. Always we'll talk to the family, maybe they've got some insight, but by getting the mail forwarded, looking at tax returns, looking through the check registers, are there recurring things that are being paid every month or, or debts that are being paid every month, uh, we can get a pretty good idea of what the assets are in the estate in the first couple of months. Okay. Is there anything you want to add to that, things you, you talk to clients about initially in the... I think that it's important to uh, look at the what's coming in the mail every month, and the best way to figure that out is by for having it forwarded because that shows a lot. Sure. And quarterly, you always want to pay attention to the end of the quarter. 
because if it's, someone dies at the beginning of a quarter, you might not see something until the end of that quarter. So you really want to double check at the end of every quarter to see if things are coming in. Sure, and of course that ties back to uh, the first quarter of every calendar year is when we see a lot of the tax information mm -hmm. coming out, which may disclose other assets that might not have made it onto the tax return for whatever the reason might be. Uh, and yet you now know that this asset exists in some form. I had a client recently that found out that they had some oil interest, you know, that their, their deceased mother had an interest in out of West Virginia mm -hmm. that she didn't know about. Well, mm -hmm. some things aren't going to show up every month. Uh, the real estate tax bill is only going to come twice a year, or maybe the bill for the safe deposit box only comes once a year. So it might be several months before you find out everything. A life insurance premium is another thing that only comes typically once a year. So. Uh, I can't guarantee that after a month you're going to have a handle on everything, but uh, keep looking through the mail and you'll get it sorted out. But that's a good process, getting control of the mail. So um, the other thing I know, I think you've mentioned, John, is that it's now one of your practices is to go on the, uh, the state's website for unclaimed property. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Virginia has a website where you can go on and fill out a fairly simple uh, questionnaire and find out if there are any assets that have not been claimed and they'll, they'll categorize it. It's zero to five dollars or five to one hundred dollars or a hundred to a thousand dollars. You get an idea of how much is involved. Uh, I think you were going to show the viewers uh, the link to that website so they can do that for themselves. Well, I think we're going to post it on our screen as well. That's a very good suggestion. Now, have either of you had any experience where, where some of these vendors will come along and, and offer to, to find you the lost assets? Um, in exchange for giving up a third of the uh, the assets they recover? Sure, but I, I ch tend to shy away from that. Uh, it, yeah, I, think, I think an executor should shy away from that, too. Absolutely. Their, their job is to marshal and get control over assets, not to give commissions for others to find those assets. I agree with that 100%. <laughs> I agree with that. Well, let's talk about forwarding the mail. So uh, obviously that's a very important step, uh, and there's a, there's a way to do that. Um, uh, Mary, talk a little bit about um, you know what you would do in order to make sure the mail gets forwarded properly. What are some of the steps you would take? Well, you can go either go to the post office or go online and simply fill out a form, uh, and that mail should be forwarded to your office. I think it should be done very quickly. Although I would say we don't want to rely exclusively on that. It's free, and so you can renew it. But I always like to s then go directly to vendors or directly to the banks and and brokerage firms and other of places that have assets of the deceased and m make them aware to change the address directly because I think sometimes it's can't always be sure you're getting everything forwarded to you. Okay, so and you would be able to do that because as the mail starts to come to you, you see some of those things and then you write to them directly and let yes. them know. Is yes, and especially suggesting? once you've qualified as the All executor, right. you really can make sure. any any company aware that you're in charge of those assets now. Sure. Now, John, I know you mentioned about um, this one association, it's called the um, Direct Mail Association, that we can reach out to um, and actually communicate with them uh, that the decedent's passed away and we want to turn off you know, some of the junk mail. Again, there's a website where you can go, and I forget exactly what they call it, Mary's like. DMA, www.dma.com. Sort of the leave, leave me alone website. <laughs> right. uh, don't contact the decedent anymore, so you can eliminate a lot of the junk mail that's right. coming in. Right, because you don't want that forwarded to your office. That, that, that's, up a lot of space. A very, that was a very good suggestion, by the way, so folks should take advantage of that. Um, so uh, let's, let's take a look now. We start to collect some of the assets, you know. Uh, you know, we, we're taking control of those assets, but there's, you know, there's a common set of assets that we also run across. So let's talk about one of the first assets that an executor or minister needs to address is, of course, is to get control of the decedent's bank account. So you head over to the bank, you have your certificate of qualification, you've gotten a tax ID form for the uh, number for the estate, uh, as the CPA has advised us, and now you show up at the bank. What are you asking the bank to do at that point with that bank account? Any suggestions? Well, one of the things I suggest is you want to open an estate account uh, so that you can start moving assets into that account. However, I suggest you keep the existing bank account open for a period of at least 60 days or so because there could be outstanding checks that haven't been cashed yet. There could be direct deposits that are still coming through that bank. There may be Social Security. And so you don't want to immediately march in, close the account. Uh, I think if you can, open an estate account at the same institution, maybe move the money over. But keep that account open for a period of time to, until you're certain that everything is run through it. I, I certainly agree, but, but I, I just add that it doesn't mean you can't take anything out of the account. We just want to leave a balance in the account so those direct deposits and withdrawals are, are being made. Uh, now, do you folks advise folks to arrange for online banking so they can see their accounts online, even though they might be writing checks physically? 
Um, but do you guys recommend they get online so they can see the accounts? I think it's a matter of personal preference. There's no reason not to. But I'm, I'm kind of a dinosaur on that one, Richard. I think once you go to an estate, I like to see the paper. Knowing what's ahead in terms of what has to be reported, I want when you open an estate account, you want to be sure you have access to the copies of the checks, and paper checks is the way that I still go. Uh, uh, you know, as far just as paying bills. And yes, just sir. even, uh, of course, online access is convenient for monitoring when things are coming through and, and so forth, but uh, I'm not even really too concerned about that as, as an executor. I always want the paper statements, but being able to go online just to see if a check is cleared or things that's like clear. that is That's okay. convenient, right. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, you touched on an important point, and, and that is that you are going to need those canceled checks when you file your final accounting with the commissioner. So it's important to set up a bank account that's going to return not the physical checks to you, but copies of the checks on the statements. You're going to need that down the road. And, and, and John makes a very important point because the commissioner, as we're going to talk in a future show, in the accountings that are reported to the commissioner, he he does require you to verify. As he says, you know, we trust but verify, both as the account balance and then who got paid and what. And even using a cashier's check won't work because you're going to have to get a receipt signed saying the person actually received the cashier's check. Right. So it is important to ask that question because not all banks do produce that sheet of checks that show that it had it cleared. And also being aware once you open that estate account, every transaction, every check or withdrawal from that account has to ultimately be reported. So it has to be an estate expense. That yes, way. yes. We do not want to do anything that is uh, not properly associated with the activity of the estate. Right, yes. right. Um, so we've talked about existing bank accounts and setting up a new checking account for the estate. So we do want to keep things separate. So, uh, John, talk a little bit about real estate, if you can, you know, and how that asset is dealt with, some challenges we have, uh, and maybe how valuation might play into to, to, uh, the probate process. Well, we always want to find out if there is real estate, of course, and uh, possibly get an appraisal. Uh, we're probably going to talk about that a little bit later and why we might need to value these assets. Uh, some problems that you run into with real estate would be insurance coverage. Uh, is there going to be coverage after the house has been vacant if no one's living there? So if there's a surviving spouse, it's not an issue, but if the last parent has died and the house is vacant, you need to check that policy to see if there's going to be a problem. Uh, you need to find out, do you have the power to sell the real estate? Are you under a duty to sell the real estate? Does the will direct you to sell? Uh, are you an administrator and you do not have the authority to sell? And what if you need to sell it but you don't have the authority to sell it? These are the kinds of issues that can be coming up when uh, dealing with real estate. And this is a, an example where uh, it's important to, to um, at least have some, some uh, discussion with an attorney uh, because some of these issues you know, asking the right questions and then getting the right answer can lead you in the right direction sooner rather than later and avoid maybe some missteps along the way. Um, uh, Mary, talk a little bit about life insurance and how that plays into the probate process and the, the, the tax process. Well, I'd say life insurance is one of those assets hopefully would not be involved in the probate process. Hopefully there's been a beneficiary designated, although uh, most insurance companies won't disclose who that beneficiary is, so it, it can catch you in kind of a little bit of a do loop. So. Generally, once the executor is qualified, it's important once they identify insurance. And there's all kinds of insurance, as we know, retired federal employees, veterans, some banks still offer insurance, small policies, but it's the executor's job to figure out what all those policies are and notify the company that the person is deceased and, ask them with, and send a copy of the death certificate. And then I think it's incumbent upon the carrier to notify the beneficiaries. Okay. And, and hopefully they will be beneficiaries. Otherwise, there, there's no beneficiaries. Some companies have default beneficiaries. And I know the federal government has that. It goes to a spouse and then a children if you haven't designated a beneficiary. And other companies don't do that. Other companies say if we don't have a valid beneficiary designation, it just gets paid to the estate. It becomes a probate asset. So I think that is certainly part of the... Uh, executor's job, uh, although if there is a beneficiary designated, then generally once the company is notified, then they, they deal directly with the beneficiary and the executor doesn't get involved. Okay. Now, the, the, the reason that the executor or administrator may still want to know about the life insurance, how much was actually paid, is that even though it might not be a probate asset, that the value of that life insurance policy may be a component for federal estate tax calculations. Mm -hmm. Is that right, John? 
Well, that's true, Richard, with the increased federal estate exemption. I, I, I don't think that many of our listeners and viewers are going to be filing estate tax returns. The, the threshold now is about $5.4 million, but you're correct. If the total value of all of the assets, probate and non-probate assets, exceeds that amount, then we're going to have to file a federal estate tax return, and you'll be getting a Form 712, which shows exactly the amount of the insurance that was taxable as part of the estate. Very good. That's true. Um, Let's talk about retirement accounts. This is another one that uh, that may or may not make its way through the probate estate, but could have an important, you know, uh, uh, part in the uh, taxable estate for a state federal estate tax purposes. Uh, John, have you had much experience with retirement accounts? Uh, very similar to what Mary just described for life insurance. Uh, generally, there's going to be a designated beneficiary. So what I would do is send in a death certificate and a certificate of qualification. And the only reason you're sending in the certificate of qualification is that you do have some authority and say. If the in the unlikely event that the estate is the beneficiary, contact me. If it's a spouse or someone else, please contact them directly. And once the, the beneficiary is contacted, the executor really has little more to do with it. Uh, the company contacts them. They give them their options for how it could be paid out, and the beneficiary deals with it. Okay. But that's another one I would certainly uh, say that the beneficiary should get some professional help. There are quite a few income tax implications for beneficiaries. And so they need to seek some professional help in, in terms of how to best set that account up and to minimize the income taxes. Uh, because if you don't take the right steps within the year after the person's death, it can trigger an ex escalation of the income tax liability. So definitely they need to seek some professional help on that. But I, I think John's right. Once it goes, once the beneficiary is named, then the executor fortunately is just lost that job and they have enough jobs they don't need any more <laughs> <laughs> happy to take that off your to-do right. list right, right. I mean, it would be unfortunate if it was payable to the estate because the income tax uh, uh, choices are far limited and mm -hmm. there's going to be some adverse income tax consequences very 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 true well another asset that we see frequently of course is people have varying types of brokerage accounts mm -hmm. okay so uh, John to talk about brokerage accounts and how that plays through in the probate process well, you'd contact the broker and ask him to give you the date of death valuations. Uh, and I'm not sure how much detail you want to go into now, but essentially an estate receives a stepped-up basis for income tax purposes, regardless of estate taxes, but for income tax purposes, equal to the fair market value on the date of death. So what the broker will do is they will set up a new estate account transfer it from the decedent's name into the estate account and once it's in the estate account you have authority to sell it or transfer it to beneficiaries or whatever but you would want to get those date of death valuations so you can uh, provide that to the beneficiaries if you're distributing the assets in kind or if you're selling the assets you can compute the gain or loss on the income tax return now I will say that that is uh, that information that detail um, you know, is something you also need in order to properly file the inventory with the Commissioner of Accounts because mm -hmm. he right. wants to know exactly what you own each share of stock and its fair market value and so on and that detail then falls its way onto the accounting process so you do want to make sure you do get that information in detail you know but for each stock or mutual fund as the case may be mm -hmm. um, and of course there are still people who hold stock certificates or they have drip programs, yes, which that's, are very, that's can really be very true. complicated. Uh, and so it's important that you not only look at just the brokerage account, but what other things might be coming in from CompuShare or, you know, what what pieces of paper might be sitting in a in a safety deposit box Absolutely. or something, because there's a lot of other things that might have to be marshaled to really get a full sense of all the investments. Now that's a very good point because uh, you know getting those certificates dealt with and transferred is not uh, an easy process. Do you recommend? Definitely going and seeing a broker about taking care of all that paperwork as opposed to dealing directly. Absolutely. Uh, I, I've had little old ladies that have had a, a wad of stock certificates about that thick. They're uh -huh. safe deposit boxes and they live through the depression and they say, there's no way I'm turning those over to a broker. <laughs> but once they pass on, you, you go to your broker, set up the estate account, let him do all the paperwork. Exactly. It's a lot of work, too. It's a exactly. Lot of work. Because really, it's not, it doesn't make any sense in this day and age to reissue stock certificates in the name of an estate. So you really just want to put them in street name as soon as possible. Sure, <laughs> sure. Let's talk a little bit about uh, ta tangible personal assets. These are going to be things from down to the silverware in the kitchen and the kitchen table and the furniture and fixtures in the house uh, out to the cars and boats that are out parked in the garage and in the carport. Tell me a little bit about how you deal with those things, Mary. 
Well, certainly the boats and cars have titles, so uh, anything that's issued a title, you have to go through the process. Fortunately, here in Virginia, the DMV makes a process of retitling a vehicle very simple. There's a form there uh, that you can go to at the DMV and, and fill it out, and, and change, as long as you can reduce your qualification certificate, you can retitle the vehicle, and the same is pretty much true for boats. When it comes to other household goods, uh, I would say that in general, while it's obviously a lot of your things are very valuable to you, they're not really valuable from a probate estate standpoint, and therefore I would try to encourage people to really just give a very low estimate. There really is any required for all those things to be appraised, or if it's just personal everyday kind of stuff. Of course, collectibles present another problem. I think the bigger problem with with personal items is is amicably dividing those things among the <laughs> family members. They may be the least monetarily value, but they often trigger the highest emotion and, and, and generate a lot of difficult uh, negotiations about, about it. John, do you have much experience with uh, <laughs> I'm trying, glad you trying to first, uh, <laughs> divide the, uh, the dining room table among the four kids' children? I think that's led to more family disputes than anything else. I mean, we can always divide cash. We can always sell assets and distribute them equally. But when the will says, I give all of my tangible personal property, my household goods, furniture, jewelry, and so forth, to my five children in equal shares, I mean, how do you do that? Uh, if the kids are able to do that themselves, I as executor or whoever the executor is, don't need to be part of the process. But that doesn't always work out quite so well. Uh, so then the executor can be called upon to, to mediate disputes and so forth. And I don't have any really simple answers. but. Mary's made an excellent point. Generally, we're not talking about great value. This is the least value in the estate, but it still produces more controversy than, than anything else. I, I certainly have seen that myself. So I would encourage parents to leave a memorandum, as they're allowed to do, a letter, a memorandum, a list, or anything else, as long as it's signed and dated, as long as it's for tangible personal property only, it's valid. So you can say, I give the Steinway Grand Piano to, to Peter, and I give all my jewelry to my niece, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that goes a long way towards eliminating the disputes. And even if you can't identify every specific item, if the person identifies a process to follow, That's uh, a good how point. to divide it up sure. fairly, bring all the kids together, yeah. everybody take a turn. If the process is fair, because usually there's only one Steinway, uh, but if everybody feels that they had a fair shot at it, then they usually can live with the outcome. It's the cases where somebody gets to the house first with the moving truck that generates a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple other things to talk about, savings bonds and T-bills. Um, have you had any experience dealing with those as an executor? Uh, yeah, sure. I would say savings bonds are difficult now because people have those, like you say, John, stacks of them from their years of civil service, but the government doesn't issue them anymore. So most people have to, and I think the executor would have to create a treasury direct account to cash those. I don't know, unless, of course, those have a designated POD, pay on death designation, but. Uh, I, I, I don't see any reason to carry those. I don't know if you're doing that, John. No, no, we're, you we're cashing cash them in. Yeah. Now, there's going to be a lot of taxable income produced as a result of cashing them in, but again, most of the heirs want, want cash, and I wouldn't want to reissue these things. And even if we could, I've never even tried to do that. No, right. And uh, as I said, they, no, they don't present the same tangible value anyway. They're not, they don't issue them, so. Okay. Well, the, the, the last uh, sort of uh, assets that I want to talk about is these all these assets you know people are using revocable trust these days and so there are uh, many assets that are part of the the estate to be eventually distributed pursuant to the revocable trust document that the the executor might still need to know about okay for estate tax purposes okay um, any thoughts about things that you do with assets in the revocable trust do you well, number one, you have no responsibility uh, or control over assets that are in the trust. Only the trustee has control over those assets. And again, I just repeat what I said before, with the threshold for filing a federal estate tax return being so high, that really isn't a practical problem very often, except in a, in a very sort of wealthy estate. Will there be a four or five million dollar uh, assets in a revocable trust? Uh, I guess the other point to make is that the non trust assets have to go through probate. Typically there will be a pour over will which says I have a trust, I meant to put everything in the trust, if I forgot to put it in the trust, put it in the trust. So the executor's job is just to marshal those assets and transfer them over to the trustee. And follow the probate process. It's not any simpler no. necessarily because you have a, a trust unless your assets are in the trust. And right. I, would, I would add one thing that 
Uh, many times, if the living trust is fully funded, which is, would be the goal, that means there are no assets in probate, but that doesn't mean there aren't debts. So a lot of times, the executor has to work with the trustee to pay off the debts, because most trusts would require the trustee pay the debts, and so the executor has to make the trustee aware of what those debts are. That's a very good point, and, and frequently we will see that the executor in probate is frequently the trustee in the revocable trust, just because the left hand and the right hand can then work together, mm -hmm. but not always. Mm -hmm. It works always. better that way. It certainly does. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, we, we, again, we're talking about the marshaling of assets, which is at the very outset of probate. Uh, Mary, some final thoughts or suggestions you would give to folks who've taken on this enormous responsibility? Well, I think my biggest uh, word of advice before the executor is qualified is for the families to share their information with their family so that the executor's job is made easy because that's probably the worst part is an executor who has no idea what this person has or how to find out it. Where, the, where it is, but it, it, even if simply as putting a binder together, write a letter to your child if you don't want to share it now, say if anything happens to me, open that letter. Because if you can provide your executor a list of what you have and keep it current, you've made the job of marshaling assets much, much easier. Excellent point. I'd echo that and say you can also include in that letter if you had any final funeral instructions mm -hmm. or distribution of personal property. Try to make it easy as you can in your family. It's not important to say that I've got $115 in the bank. It's to say I've got an account at BB&T. I've got an account at Merrill Lynch. Uh, not the composition of the assets so much. We can always find that out if we know where to go look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've, we've come to the conclusion of a very, uh, what I would consider to be entertaining conversation, and I hope we've put no one to sleep at home. Right. <laughs> but um, I want to thank you know, Mary and John for thank taking you. the time to, to talk with us and speak with us about this particular process. You know, everything we talked about is really important in the probate process, and uh, I think you've done a great job of taking some very complicated areas and breaking it down into digestible action items <laughs> for, our, for our, our laymen who serve as executors and administrators. So thank you again both for thank participating you. today. Well, this brings us to the conclusion of our show today on marshaling the assets in the probate of an estate. We hope you will find the information provided mm -hmm. helpful and that you will act on the recommendations of these probate professionals. Some of the discussion today will be collected on the Probate Nation website should you want to review it in the future. And of course, this show will eventually be posted to that website as well. I strongly encourage you to sit down with a probate professional early in the probate administration. Proper steps taken now will make the administration of the estate, the reporting to the commissioner and tax authorities, and the eventual distribution to beneficiaries and the wrap-up of the estate go so much smoother. So you can accomplish much and travel far on your probate journey. You were qualified by the probate office, you gave notice to the beneficiaries, and you filed your affidavit with the probate office to confirm that all work was done. You have filed the inventory with the Commission of Accounts, and you obtained your federal tax identification number, and now have filed some initial requests for tax clearance with the various tax authorities. And finally, you're now beginning to take control of the probate assets as you set up a state checking account and begin the process of managing the probate assets while probate continues. So the probate train continues now on its way to the next stop where we will review how to properly account to the Commission of Accounts just what you have received, what you've dispersed, and what you distributed over the last account year. On behalf of myself and the entire probate nation, thank you for visiting with us.